And finally, we get to Kant. Kant is probably the most complete moral theory with the most detail and the most rigor. It can almost stand alone, where all the other moral theories do need a little help by having kind of a hybrid or a composite theory. Kant needs only a little bit of a nudge to get rid of its, its minor problems. It is very rigorous though. Let me start by saying something about Kant briefly because this isn't a name that's well known, but in philosophy circles this is a big deal. On almost every list of what are the most of who are the most important philosophers that ever lived, I don't think there's any list out there that doesn't put Kant in the top five, usually top three with Aristotle and Plato. Kant is also, to my estimation, the last philosopher that really tried to solve all of the major issues in philosophy. I mean, he had major theories in political, fairness, justice, he, had, he has the full ethical theory, theory of knowledge, theory of re reality, theories about religion and God's existence. People don't do this anymore. They don't try to cover the whole gamut of serious philosophical questions. Kant is the last of the dying breed. And then on the silly side of things, uh, what Einstein was for our society 40 years ago, that's what Kant was in his day, right? In Prussia, Germany, and Europe, Kant was the man. I mean, everybody referred to him as this mysterious weirdo that just knew everything, just amazing. The small little things that I like about him, Quite literally, people set their watch in his town by his walks. His whole life was like clockwork, and he spent countless hours rigorously going through all of these issues. There is even, I, I saw an ad, a beer ad, in this day, in what, late 1700s, that if you've seen these ads that say you won the Super Bowl, with, you're going to Disneyland, or it's Miller time, time to have a beer. Well, there was literally a beer ad that went out when Kant released one of his major works, A Critique of Pure Reason, and it was the same thing as what sports are in our society. It was, Kant, what are you going to do now? You just finished your 12 years of working on The Critique of Pure Reason. And he's like, I'm going to have a Konigsbra, or what, I don't know what beer it was. But I mean, this is what a big deal it was. Oh, sorry, of course, this isn't televised. This is a print ad. There isn't television at the time, right? But it was this ad, and it was, you know, like, Kant, the sports hero, his favorite beer is this, now that he finished the critique of pure reason after, you know, over a decade of working on it. And then he goes on and works on all the other problems in philosophy. Anyway, all right, sorry. More importantly, let's frame the nerdiness of these ideas, because what you'll find is if we frame this in the correct way, it'll prevent a bunch of misconceptions people have about this. Okay, so first, very important, keep this in mind every time you see a possible problem. Kant does not think he is proposing a new moral theory. He is not saying, here is what I think you should all follow when it comes to right and wrong. No. As with all of Kant's thoughts, Kant merely thinks he is articulating or bringing out what is already going in our heads when we think about anything, and in this case, morality. So he is not saying, I'm proposing a new idea. He thinks he's simply articulating what is at the foundation of our moral thinking when we think about right and wrong. So if you're trying to wiggle your way out or find some way to cheat through Kant or find some little loophole, then you're doing it wrong. He is saying, this is what moral thinking looks like, and this is what it is when we want to be moral. If you don't want to be moral, then don't use the theory, because that's not how this is supposed to work. He is saying, when you want to check the morality of what you're thinking of doing, here's what you check. Here's how you go through the steps to see if you're doing something that is right. And the second important preface, he starts this piece with. I mean, this is, of course, a longer book, and I'm just giving you the key pieces. But where I start our, our excerpts is the other second key thing that we need to keep in mind at all times when we're reading Kant to avoid misunderstanding. So I'm reading at the very beginning. Nothing can possibly be conceived in the world or even out of it which can be called good without qualification except a good will. So the only thing that is always good, no matter what, is a good will. 
intelligence, wit, judgment, and the other talents of the mind, however they may be named, or courage, resolution, perseverance, as qualities of temperament, are undoubtedly good and desirable in many respects, but these gifts of nature may also become extremely bad and mischievous if the will which is to make use of them, and which therefore constitutes what is called character, is not good. Yes, he loves long sentences, but notice what he's getting at. He is saying the only judge of things that is always universally good is this good will, this good intent that is within us. Every other character trait, and yes, right now he is poking at people like Aristotle. I mean, think of having perseverance or motivation or self-control or, I mean, all these things that we think of as good. And you could see, well, yeah, if a serial killer has those traits, they'll be able to kill many more people. If they're highly intelligent, self-controlled, patient, right? Oh, that makes them an even better serial killer. Do you get the idea? So he's saying the only goodness that is good without question is something of our moral intent, this goodwill that we possess. Now, let's add to this a fancy word, a word that you're used to using. Let me just unpack it so you can see what this is. Now, what Kant is doing here, and these are like some of his critics. I remember having a teacher that was fairly critical of Kant. I mean, again, thought he was brilliant, said he thought out a great agenda, but he had this bone to always pick with Kant, he would say. Kant is trying too hard to defend Protestant Christian ethics. And so he keeps stretching his theories to fit Protestant, Protestant Christian ethics. So we will see some of this. But right here, there is a key thing that he is up to. This is part of the Enlightenment. This is part of, you know, we get the idea of post-Lutheran Protestant Christianity where we're having to start over. The church used to be the authority on everything. And so this is written in the day where, okay, the church has lost some of its authority because of some corruption and so forth. And so we need to start intelligence on a new footing of rationality. And so what we could see Kant is doing right here is he is trying to replace this idea of the human soul as the seat of human worth and goodness. And so he needs to have a secular or purely rational idea that would give human beings infinite worth. And the best placeholder idea is this idea of what's called autonomy. Yes, you've heard of this and people think of being independent and autonomous as being the same thing. But let me carefully nuance this just by getting into the root of the idea. The Greek words, of course. What do we have? Auto means self. Nomos means law. And so the idea of autonomy is the ability to apply laws to yourself. It does not mean you are completely free and you do whatever you want. It's not that notion of independence. It's this incredible trait that humans have. Kant will say only humans have it. Animal rights people are going to argue that it's a spectrum of autonomy. But the idea is, it is the human's ability to apply rules to their own behavior and thoughts that give them infinite worth. If I am faced with a plate full of brownies in the kitchen, I have my own laws that I apply to myself that coerces my behavior. Now, if you have a dog that doesn't jump on those brownies and eat them all, a Kantian would say, well, that's because the dog is trying to please you. The dog doesn't do it for its own sake. The dog doesn't think, you know what, I need to count my calories. No, he is trying to please you, and so he resists. But a human being has these, what some philosophers will call, second-order desires, which says, I want to be a good person, so I'm going to follow my own self-given rules. I am not just worried about my wife getting mad at me, right? That's not as important. But I have my own laws because I want to be good. And so this goodwill is this ability to seek what is the best action by applying laws to ourselves. And so this ability to be autonomous, to use our intelligence, to coerce our will into doing the right thing, is for Kant what gives humans incomparable worth. Notice that idea. Nothing has as much worth as the autonomous human being, and this autonomy must be protected, it must be um, helped to flourish, 
and it must never be disrespected. That's the core of his moral view. So now, sadly, we need some more notes. I need to get you used to some other bits of this vocabulary. Again, so sorry, I don't normally teach like this, but we need this vocabulary to make sense of what Kant is doing. The next key pieces of the vocabulary are this difference between a hypothetical and a categorical imperative. Good? Okay. A hypothetical imperative. So imperative, I think, is already clear. An imperative is a command, something you must do. But a hypothetical imperative is something you must do if you have a certain goal. If you don't want a ticket when a cop's around, you must drive near or at the speed limit. You must do that or you will get a ticket, right? If I want to get in shape, I must exercise and eat healthy. Fine, we get this. So if you have this goal, here's the hypothetical comparative. A hypothetical is an if then, it's a condition. If you want this, then you must do that hypothetical comparative. Key difference is the categorical imperative. Hypothetical, in certain conditions, if you have these goals, you have to do X. Categorical, to be moral, you have to do this no matter what. In every case, in any context, this is the thing to do categorically, meaning universally every time. Good? Categorical, imper categorical imperative, to be moral, this must be done no matter what. Good. Next. I like this next little piece of subtlety. Where most moral theories will simply say you've done the right thing or you've done the wrong thing. Utilitarianism, very clear this way. You've done the right thing if you've promoted happiness or maximized happiness. You've done the wrong thing if you haven't. Well, with Kant, we have three levels. We have the right action, we have the wrong action, and we have the praiseworthy action. I like this. So notice, we, we have three different answers. Here is an action, here is something you are thinking of doing. Well, it's either wrong, it's right, that means it's a moral thing, or it's a morally great action, something praiseworthy, meritorious, right, to use a fancy word. Now, the wrong action is going to be the action, now notice, here's some vocabulary that will come up, but I won't define this yet. The wrong action fails the categorical imperative test. We will get to this. We'll call it the CI, the categorical imperative test. So you are doing the wrong thing if you fail the CI, the categorical imper imperative test. You have done something right, right? Permissible, morally okay, if it passes the categorical imperative test, where the grandest level is doing something that is praiseworthy. Kant will say it has genuine moral worth. It's not just right, you have done something morally good, right? You have done something great, not just permissible. And here's where Kant gets a little funky, and here is where some of that Protestant Christian ethic might be overlapping with the clearest idea of the theory. Okay, so here's the idea. An action that is praiseworthy is one that is done for morality's sake. You've done this action simply because it is the right thing to do. You didn't do it to bring yourself pleasure. You didn't do it for any other reason of desire. You did it because it's right. Here is another little bit of vocabulary. Kant will talk about our inclinations. This simply means our desires, our passions, our feelings, our goals even, are these inclinations we have. And so what Kant is trying to say is an action of genuine moral worth that is praiseworthy is not done for any reason of inclination. It is not done because it makes you happy, brings you pleasure, or gets you praise or fame, or of course not money. It is done purely because it was the right thing to do, and your intent was purely moral. I did action X because I knew it was the right thing to do. We'll talk about this as a possible problem near the end. All right, we're almost there. One more dry piece of vocabulary. This is the idea of a maxim. Okay. 
when we were talking about the oral, other moral theories, right, I gave these little hints that when we get to Kant, we'll get to a moral theory where the moral worth of an action hinges on the intent of the action. And notice, this is very intuitive for us. If I accidentally do something, we don't say I'm as culpable or as praiseworthy if I didn't mean to do it at all. We want to say that the good action is one that was intended. And so it's the intent of the person that has the, the moral weight of it. All right, so this is why Kant will focus on the maxim. Here's the idea. Kant thinks, and I agree with him, that any thoughtful person has, and here's what a maxim means, a maxim is a subjective principle of volition. That's Kant's definition. A subjective principle of volition. What this means. You have these little personal rules that you use to guide your will, that lead you, that guide your choices, for, another, for lack of a better word. You have these little principles, these little rules, these little shortcuts that help you make decisions so you don't have to calculate everything like a utilitarian. You have these principles. So, here's the idea. Whenever you are thinking about, say, holding the door for someone behind you, whenever you're trying to decide whether it's okay to litter, Kant is saying, and I think he's right, that any thoughtful person has a little shorthand set of rules of what is this context and what should I do? And so, let's say for opening a door. Maybe when you open a door, your mind goes through this little quick checklist of saying, okay, I look back, if the person is approaching really closely, then I wait for this amount of time and I hold the door open. If I'm going through a doorway and the person looks like they are, say, eight seconds away, and so it would be eight seconds of holding the door, I mean, maybe you don't calculate it in that kind of a way, but you have kind of this instinctive rule you follow that tells you how long will you hold that door open. And of course, maybe your maxim also contains, oh, if their hands are full or if they look disabled or weak or something's wrong, then I would wait some extra seconds. If it is someone that really looks like they're having a hard time carrying things, disabled, then I wait even longer and so on, right? Maybe some of you are creepy with your inclinations and you say, I look and see if they're attractive. <laughs> no, but that's in your maxim. These little rules you use to shortcut all of your thinking here are the little principles I decide when I'm going to do an action. When you are going to speed in your car, I am sure you have a set of, a set of maxims that decide how fast you'll go and what are the conditions. For instance, some of you right now are saying, what do you mean, I speed whenever I want? No, you don't, right? If it is very foggy and you can't see more than 20 yards ahead of you, I'm sure your maxim says, no, don't go very fast in that case. When there is a cop right next to you, your maxim includes, nope, when there is a cop around, don't go more than 5, 10, mi 10 miles over the speed limit. Exactly. So we have these maxims that help guard, guide our behavior, and a lot of these maxims have moral content. Fine. Here's the key. In order to judge whether your maxim is moral, and that's the core to the theory, judging our intent, which is seem to contained in these maxims. We have to think of our maxim as, as having three properties, right? Three ingredients in every maxim. First, your maxim will have a goal. What are you after? And your maxim will have a context, and then your maxim will contain the green light for an action. So you should think of it as, and let me try to draw it up as a chart, in order to achieve blank, in order to achieve A, I will do action B given circumstances C. Sorry, I shouldn't do it with letters. But for this goal, I will do this action in these circumstances. That's how we should articulate a maxim so that we can judge our intention to see if it is wrong, right, or praiseworthy. There's the idea. So, maxim. So, to review. Let's look at, so for example, what's in your head when it comes to littering. Now, maybe some of you just never, ever litter. Well, sure. That's great, right? That's very categorical of you. But, for me, I will only litter when it is quickly biodegradable and I know no one will see it 
in the process of, de of biodegrading. Notice. So, if I'm eating an apple, and I have an apple core, and I'm out in the middle of nowhere where no one's around, and I know I can put this apple core somewhere where it will, will actually help the other vegetation, it'll decompose and help the soil. But notice the limit. I cannot throw this into a bush unless I know no one will ever see this. It'll decompose and nourish this bush and no one will ever find it. So notice, what does that mean? There is a very strict limit as to what I can litter and in what context I can litter. And what is my goal? My goal is to help the environment and never be a nuisance to anyone do not litter except in cases where no one will be offended by it and it will actually help the vegetation help things grow. You get the idea? So my maxim has a goal and it has a context before I could do it. And so what does this mean? It's going to be a very rare case where I could litter anything. In all other cases, I have to wait till I can find a trash can to put it in. Do you get it? And so finally, we can now look at what the CI test is. This is how we determine whether an action is right or wrong, whether it passes the categorical imperative test. Kant swears that all of these categorical imperative versions are actually at heart the same thing. So we do talk about the categorical imperative test, even though there are five different ways to think about it or five different ways to carry out the test. For our class, I am simplifying this a great deal, Thanks, Jeff. Yes, you're welcome. The most commonly used ones are two, the universal law and ends in themselves versions. So that's what we'll refer to. Now, please note, these are just two of five versions, but we will simply treat them as CI1, CI2 for short. Good. All right. So according to the first version of the categorical imperative, here is what the test says. So now, I am on page two of our excerpts, and I am going to start right where that bold break in the middle of the page is. Here is CI for us, CI number one. I am never to act otherwise than so that I could also will that my maxim should become a universal law. Let me say this in a few different ways, so please add these multiple translations or interpretations to your notes. So. You hear the quote, you see it right in the middle of page two. Another way, act only on those maxims which you can will to become a universal law. We'll flush that out. Maxims, remember what those are. A maxim is only right if you could will, you could choose for everyone to follow it as if they had to. That's the idea of a universal law. You are setting down a moral or behavioral law as if it's a law of nature, as if it's the law of gravity, to where everyone in the same situation as you has to follow your maxim. Yes, that means they have to follow your behavior, but again, most importantly, is the intent. So this maxim has to be followed by everyone who is in the same situation you're in. Can you will that? Detail, nerdy detail. Kant says that you can't even will an immoral maxim if everyone were to follow it because it will lead to a contradiction. It will either lead to being impossible for everyone to follow because you're making an exception for yourself, you can't will that others follow it, or it would contradict the goal you're after. Remember, the maxim contains why you're doing it, and the idea is the morality of your maxim is revealed by the fact that others couldn't follow your example. They couldn't act on your maxim. It will contradict itself somehow. We'll get it. Another way to, to talk about this, simplified, not as accurate, but I think we need these general translations. Act only on maxims that it will be possible for everyone to follow. Again, it is possible for everyone to follow it or even more basic, right? Even more uh, vague and uncareful. Are you trying to make an exception for yourself? Is your maxim such that it's only for you, you are in a way taking advantage of others by be using a maxim that you wouldn't want others to follow? Now you get it. Now we can hear those granny cliches. What if everyone did that? That's the basic idea. 
you are making an exception for yourself. You don't want everyone else to do what you are doing. But again, not just the action, the intent, the maxim behind the action. Try the second one. So what we'll call CI number two. Again, it's not really what it is, but we are only having two. Turn now to page four. And again, I'll read the bold, right, the break in the page. So act as to treat humanity, whether in your own person or in that of any other, in every case and as an end, never as means only. So let me do the same thing. Let me say this in a bunch of different ways for your notes if this helps make it, make it clear. First, always treat humanity as an end in itself and never merely or simply as a means. Another one. Never use people for your goals if they wouldn't rationally consent to help. Most vague, most general, always respect people as having their own goals. Okay, now we're getting the flavor of this. So CI number two is hearkening back to that idea of autonomy. People have this amazing ability to use self-given rules to coerce their actions. And what you're doing when you break CI number two is you're forcing them to do your bidding. You are coercing people into doing what your goals are instead of what they would choose. That is absolutely disrespecting their autonomy to guide their actions by their own rules. You get the idea. I think it's nice. I mean, I really like Kant. Needs a little help at the end, but this is a really good solid theory. Fortunately, and I, I think Kant saw this, this is so tricky that we've got to see it at work in some examples, and I think it will become clear how to use these two versions of the CI test when it comes to these things. So let's see how CI number one, the universal law version of the categorical imperative, would apply to a suicide case. So I am going to be reading on page two after the break in the page that contains CI number one, and I will simply go into that paragraph that begins here now. I'm going to the fifth line. Here is a person talking about their con considering line. Should I be content that my maxim, to extricate myself from difficulty by a false promise, fancy word for lying, should hold good as a universal law for myself as well as for others? And should I be able to say to myself, everyone may make a deceitful promise when he finds himself in a difficulty from which he cannot otherwise extricate himself, end quote. Then I presently become aware that while I can will the lie, I can by no means will that lying should be a universal law, for with such a law there would be no promises at all, skip a line. Hence my maxim, as soon as it should be made a universal law, would necessarily destroy itself. Now do you see this? I think this one's very clear. If you were to make it universal that people lie when they need to get out of a difficulty or need money or whatever these things are, that they would lie. Well, obviously, that would make lying impossible because if it's universal, everyone's going to lie in such cases and so no one would believe a promise ever. When you promise to do something, someone's going to say, well, it's very likely that they're doing this as just to get what they want and lie and so I'm not going to trust anyone and lying's impossible if people don't think you're telling the truth ever. Do you get it? I think it's clear. All right, let's try another one of Kant's examples. This idea of whether we should help others. Now look at it. This is on page three. The paragraph is labeled with a number four. A fourth who is in prosperity while he sees that others have to contend with great wretchedness and that he could help them thinks, quote, what concern is it of mine? Let everyone be as happy as heaven pleases or as he, as he can make himself. I will take nothing from him, nor even envy him, only I do not wish to contribute anything to his welfare or to his ass assistance in distress." End quote. It is impossible to will that such a principle should have the universal validity of a law of nature. For a will which resolved this would contradict itself, inasmuch as many cases might occur in which one would have need of the love and sympathy of others, and in which by such a law of nature, sprung from, from his own will, he would deprive himself of all hope of the aid he desires. Now notice this one. Kant is kind of stretching this pretty far, but it does follow well. If you say that when things are going well for me, I am not going to help other people. He is saying that if you will that, what your goal is, is a goal, is a contented, untroubled life. That's your goal. And so you don't help others because you see that as distraction from your peaceful, prosperous life. 
Well, notice, you have just made it by following that maxim. When you try to universalize it, that means no one can help others. When they're feeling prosperity and don't want to be distracted, you've just said, it is now a law. I've universalized this idea that people won't help others. Well, we can't live that way. Sorry, I don't know how jaded you are and cynical you are. I mean, look at our politics right now. No one can say that they weren't helped by others. And you've ruined that ability for us to even survive by using such a general maxim. Let alone our parents had to help us to just survive. Please realize that you use roads and water and electricity. You go to schools, right? All these things that all the rest of us collectively pay for and provide. You did not do everything on your own. What is wrong with Americans? They really think they don't need each other. Oh my gosh. Anyway, but so Kant is saying, if you universalize that, no one can help you when you might need, be in need, and we always need one another. So do you get the basic idea? When it is made universal, CI test number one leads to a contradiction. It doesn't lead to your goal and or it can't even be willed because you've made your maxim impossible if everyone follows it like a law. All right, so let's try the same examples with the second test, right? Again, it's all one test, just different perspectives, just different angles for coming at it. Sorry, we're jumping all around. Go to page four again, and now look at where it says number two. He who is thinking of making a lying promise to others will see at once that he would be using another man merely as a mean, without the latter containing at the same time the end in himself. For, for whom I propose by such a promise to use for my own purposes cannot possibly assent to my mode of acting towards him, and therefore cannot himself contain the end of this action. Okay, <laughs> very wordy. Kant is a genius, but he's really hard to read. But, but he is clear. He's just so obsessively perfect in his writing. All right, here we go. The idea here is when you lie to someone, you are forcing them to aid you when they never consented to. You have a goal, getting money, let's say. It is not the same goal. It is not a goal that they can share. So you are forcing them to adopt a goal that is not theirs. You are coercing them into adopting something by lying that they would not agree to. So you are disrespecting their ability to guide their own actions by their own will. Now, let's be careful. A key part of this phrase is treating someone merely as a means. Because we will often treat each other as a means to our goals, but not merely as a means or not only as a means. Because we can ask people for help, but respect their desires by allowing them to freely choose to help us. If I need to move some furniture and I ask someone and they freely decide that, yes, Jeff isn't so bad, right? I will freely share Jeff's goal because I want to be a nice person, so I help him. Now notice, I'm using that person as a means to my goal, but they have freely consented to share in that goal. So I'm not treating them only as a means, I am treating them as an end also. I am letting them decide their goals and their actions. I am not disrespecting them, but I'm asking a favor and letting them freely consent as autonomous human beings. Okay, I <laughs> hope that's clear. So try again helping one another. Go to the very last paragraph of our excerpt, label number four. The natural end which all men have is their own happiness. Now humanity might indeed subsist, although no one should contribute anything to the happiness of others, provided he did not intentionally withdraw anything from it. But after all, this would only harmonize negatively, not positively, with humanity as an end in itself. If everyone does not also endeavor, as far as in him lies, to forward the end of others. Now notice, this one's a little more tricky. The idea is that we all share this collective goal of achieving our goals and attaining happiness and prosperity, contentedness. And so, because we all have these goals, we need to promote other people's goals. This is what Kant calls a positive duty. Now, a negative duty is something you should never do. But a positive duty is something that you need to try to contribute to as best as you can. There is no hard and fast rule of when you need to help others, but to refuse to ever do it 
is contradicting your basic positive duty. So this person, now again, someone might say, not helpful someone sometimes, but if you use it in this principled way, it is my maxim to follow it this way, then you're universalizing it. And you're making it so that no one can help others when that is a basic positive duty we all have. Now, isn't that perfectly clear? Don't lie to me. No, it's not. This is why I inserted this little O'Neill excerpt, right? She does a great job of laying this out more clearly than Kant does. So, she is going to use the end in itself categorical imperative test, and she's going to make it a lot clearer. Okay, so watch this. So go to the O'Neill excerpt, go to the last paragraph of page one. We use others as mere means if what we do reflects some maxim to which they could not in principle consent. Kant does not suggest that there is anything wrong about using someone as a means. Evidently, every cooperative scheme of action does this. Again, helping each other's freedom. A government that agrees to provide free or subsidized food to famine relief agencies both uses and is used by the agencies. A peasant who sells food in a local market both uses and is used by those who buy it. In such examples, each party to the transaction can and does consent to take part in that transaction. Kant would say that the parties to such transactions use one another but, not, but do not use one another as mere means. Each party assumes that the other has its own maxims of action and is not just a thing or prop to be used or manipulated. So now let's see how she articulates this. That's really nice to word in. She's going to apply it to this case of helping others. In this case, she's going to talk about famine relief. So now I'm in the, in the middle of page two, after that break that's, that, that starts to treat others, go five lines down. Since finite rational beings cannot generally achieve their aims without some help and support from others, a general refusal of help and support amounts to failure to treat others as rational and autonomous beings, that is, as ends in themselves. Skip two lines. Since famine, great poverty, and powerlessness all undercut the possibility of autonomous action, and the requirement of treating others as ends in themselves demands that Kantians standardly act to support the possibility of autonomous action where it is most vulnerable, Kantians are required to do what they can to avert, reduce, and remedy famine. Okay, so applying it to famine. But the basic idea is we all are autonomous beings with goals. And our positive duty is to promote other people's ability to follow their autonomous goals. Now again, go back to this preface. It is autonomy that gives humans incomparable worth. This would be like standing by and watching someone be murdered. We can't let that happen. We have a positive duty to promote autonomy and see it respected and flourish. Does that make sense? Now you probably already noticed that during certain cases, one categorical imperative test will have a cleaner and clearer application than the other. Well, notice, it's kind of nice because Kant insists that these will lead to the same answers. So that means whenever one of them gives a very clear answer, we can take that as a good judgment. So in some cases, like in the helping others case, right, the universal law version made it pretty clear why you can't universalize that because you might need help one day, where the ends in themselves case was a little trickier and we had to go for, to O'Neill for some help. But notice, whichever version gives you a nice clean answer, that's right. So now let's go to the usual thing we do, test our four common contemporary moral issue cases, lying, abortion, suicide, murder. All right, so let's go. So first, Let's see if murder could pass the CI test. Good? So, right. Think of a common sort of murder maxim. Out of revenge or because I want to steal their car, I am planning on murdering someone to make myself happy, to get myself something I need, whatever it is. Well, now, obviously. Can you universalize a murdering maxim in this case? No, of course not, just like we saw with the other obvious cases. If you universalize this, your life could never be one of peace because people would murder you any second you had something that might make them happy. No one, well, I guess one person would live if we universalized any sort of common murder maxims. 
easy. In murdering someone, CI test number two, are you treating them as a mere means? Of course you are. They would not consent to be murdered. Your goal is not one they shared. They wouldn't want to die if that's what it took to help you move your furniture. No, they wouldn't consent to be killed. This obviously fails both maxims. Kant has the very, the most clear prescription against murder. You can't murder. Obvious answer. Suicide. The suicide case is a little foggy, a little murky for Kant. So let's listen to him apply the two, the two versions. So first, go to page three. It's where the paragraph is labeled number one. I'm going to skip to the fourth line. So this is a person in despair. Their life is miserable. They don't see a, a positive future. Standard suicide sort of narrative. Line four, paragraph begins number one. His maxim is, from self-love, I adopt it as a principle to shorten my life when, it is, when its longer duration is likely to bring more evil than satisfaction. We get the idea. Wordy way of saying, I don't see my life being anything but a disappointment. I don't see any happiness or satisfaction ever being as much as the misery. Okay. It is asked then simply whether this principle founded on self-love can become a universal law of nature. Now we see at once that a system of nature of which it should be a law to destroy life by means of the very feeling whose special nature it is to impel the improvement of life would contradict itself. Again, a little bit murky. But the idea is your goal in committing suicide is to make your life better in a way, to give yourself less unhappiness. Well, so notice, I mean, it's kind of an awkward logic, but the idea is if your maxim is universalized, you are having a maxim that destroys life in order to make it better. And so notice there's this kind of awkward contradiction. But again, let's try the second version and see if it gives us a clear version. Again, let's use Kant. Let him articulate this. So page four, paragraph labeled number one. Notice, it's the same sort of situation. He who contemplates suicide should ask himself whether his action can be consistent with the idea of humanity as an end in itself. If he destroys himself in order to escape from painful circumstances, he uses a person merely as a means. Notice a person, himself, right? We have a duty to ourselves. A person merely as a mean to maintain a tolerable condition up to the end of life. But a man is not a thing. That is to say, something which can be used merely as means, as a means to pleasure, but must in all his actions be always considered as an end in himself. I cannot therefore dispose in any way of a man, in my own person, so as to mutilate him, to damage or kill him. Now, this I think makes a lot more sense, but I do think suicide cases are more subtle, and I think the subtlety shows up here in this kind of difficulty. But notice, if we need to respect autonomy in human beings, respect their ability to seek their goals and coordinate their behavior according to their goals, well, obviously, suicide is killing, absolutely disrespecting our own autonomy, our own ability to seek our own ends. But I hope some of you are kind of second-guessing this one because, again, I think the maxim, and sorry, the categorical imperative test is great, but I think right there you can see some room for where Kant might have some subtlety that he's not appreciating. Because, can we imagine a life where to extend that life is to, in a way, disrespect autonomy? Can you imagine a life that is pure suffering and the person cannot follow their maxims or achieve their goals or their autonomy at all? Again, I think there might be room for a potential allowable suicide in some very radical cases. Think of a person, now this one's pretty obvious, think of a person with thoroughgoing Alzheimer's dementia. My dad recently died of Alzheimer's dementia. And as this disease progresses, autonomy is absolutely thwarted to the point where the person cannot act on what they will. They have an autonomous will and the Alzheimer's makes it impossible to follow it in any rational sort of way. What they desire is being absolutely diminished by the disease. 
you get the idea. So I think there might be some subtlety here. Now notice, line already covered, covered it clearly. Kant is going to be absolutely adamant that line cannot be possible. Might be, again, there might be the need to appreciate some very few cases where line might be possible. Don't get me wrong. The vast majority of lying maxims would not pass, and it's obvious why. You would make promising impossible. No one would believe anyone. You are trying to make an exception for yourself, and you are taking advantage of other people's autonomy. But let's come back to that when we look at the objections, right? So hold off on this case right there about the subtlety of maybe some passable lying maxims. All right. Finally, our final example is tricky abortion cases. Now, notice, you could see that the most, like, thoughtless sort of abortion maxim wouldn't be able to be universalized if it says something like, whenever I find a pregnancy uncomfortable or it wasn't completely planned and it was a surprise to me or something, if we said, if we were trying to universalize a maxim like that, eh, that would be pretty tough. I mean, we might have very few births in the world if this is a really kind of flippant sort of abortion maxim. Okay. Now let's try one that is a little more realistic, a little more common. Good. Say someone is seeking an abortion in a case where this is an unplanned pregnancy, this will bring quite a bit of hardship, this will reorient my entire life, this would very possibly lead to a real divergent in my ability to seek the life I want, to have the kind of family I, I am ready for, even to seek the career that I am seeking. Now notice, this is going to be very subtle. This is going to be existing on a spectrum for how much those cases, how dire they truly are. But so notice, but you can imagine certain cases where this act of abortion, in a sense, could be universalized in the most extreme cases because it would be such a rare occasion that this wouldn't be rampant abortions diminishing the population of the planet or something like this. Now, here is a case where the second test, right, treating others as ends in themselves, would probably need to be applied as well. Now, notice, if we knew for a fact that a fetus was a fully autonomous agent, then we would say, well, no, it's going to take the most radical, incredibly rare case where you could kill it, because this would be the equivalent of murder. But notice, it is a very hard to argue that a fetus is autonomous. In fact, it's very hard to argue that an infant is autonomous. That doesn't mean you can go having 14th trimester abortions. You can't go killing your infants. But notice the considerations start to change. We have to consider that this is something, now notice what O'Neill did. We need to promote autonomy wherever we can. Well, this is going to get pretty fuzzy, but notice, this is an entity, a fetus, that will, what do you say, 80% of the time, we do have to think about miscarriages and all of these things, but say 80% of the time, this will grow to be a fully autonomous human being, and so we must, pr must promote its welfare. We must promote autonomy wherever we can, and so the fetus should be protected in the vast majority of cases, is what Kant could, would say. Now, of course, you can really stretch the subtlety of these cases and try to say something like, and this is worth arguing, that there are certain cases where abortion is absolutely thwarting the autonomy of the pregnant woman, yes. But notice how full-fledged that kind of dire circumstance would need to be in order for it to pass these sort of tests. So Kant is going to outlaw or refuse the vast majority of abortion maxims. He just is. Again, very Christian Protestant sort of results. And you see how it would work. All right. We're almost done. I know this is incredibly long. I was getting you ready for this with my fun <laughs> videos from before. So please, I hope I earned some credit with you so you can put up with this. So the objections to Kant, let's talk about the three most common objections. The first objection, which I feel very strongly, and I love Kant, but I feel this one strongly, is that Kant is goes too far in denigrating emotion or passion or inclinations. 
I do think, and this is why I, I am very much a care ethic Kantian combo myself, and this is why I think this is needed, because a care ethic is going to say some of our emotions are completely appropriate because they're, they further our motivation to help others and to do the right thing. Well, Kant is going to say, any time your inclinations prompt you to say, care for one another, he would say, you're doing the right thing, but you shouldn't be praised because you're not doing it for purely moral reasons. Here is where I think Kant needs some help. Because I would say this, now please bear with me, this gets a little nerdy. There are what are called overdetermined actions. This means you this means you commit an act for multiple reasons, and each of those reasons would have led you to the same action. So for example, let's say I see a child that's that's in distress. Well, I am going to help that child for multiple reasons. I'm going to help that child because it's the right thing to do, and that's just how we need to treat one another. But I'm also going to treat that child because my emotions, my sympathy, feel for the child. It hurts me to see a child in distress, and so I have to help them, even if it's just to make myself feel better. It hurts me to see a hurt child, and so I have to act. Now notice, Kant might question the action's worth because I am acting out of emotion. But notice... The moral maxim would have been enough stimulus to do the action even if my sympathies were misfiring at the time. Let's say I was having a bad day, didn't feel very sympathetic. Well, if I would still act even without emotion, then of course Kant would have to say, yes, that is a praiseworthy action, even though there were multiple maxims that could have made you do the act, it is overdetermined. Morality itself would have carried me through that action, but it was further spurned on by emotion. I think we can make that little corrective to, to Kant here, and I think this would be passable. The second common objection to Kant is this idea that it doesn't give us a motivation to be moral. What is the payoff? In utilitarianism, the payoff is happiness of others and happiness of ourselves. In care, it's the promotion of our relationships. In virtue, it is promoting our own excellence. Why should we be moral here? Well, notice, Kant has already answered that in those prefaces I was mentioning. Kant is saying you only apply these categorical imperative tests because you want to see if you're doing the right thing. He is not giving you a motivation. He is simply telling you, simply explicating what it means to be moral. And it is us that wants to be moral in the first place. And that's why we apply these tests, because we want to be good people. We want to have, in Kant's words, a good will. So notice, it's kind of a mistaken objection. Although I do like what else Kant says elsewhere. He says, right, paraphrasing, the only thing better than happiness is to be happy knowing that you deserve happiness. Deserving happiness because you are a good person is the only kind of happiness that we should find satisfying and fulfilling. We should want to deserve happiness even more than just being happy by itself. I think that's brilliant. I think that's great. And finally, the third objection, is, and this is the one I said we'd come back to, and that's the idea of very unique circumstances that Kant isn't quick to consider. For example, let's start with a cornula. When I first got married, I always told the truth. I was a very Kantian sort of person. I've grown to be a more of a care ethic person. But I've always been, been this kind of duty-bound, very Kantian. And so I just was very uncomfortable with lying. I just thought that was an immoral thing in every case. I had to be coached by wifey that sometimes lying is caring. So, for example, when we would first get married, my wife would ask me, is it pretty obvious that I've gained some weight since, since the birth of our child? And I would be honest and just say, yeah, but it's cute. You're, you have a baby. She would say, you are a terrible husband. You are supposed to lie at those times. Took me a while to learn. For instance, same sort of question would come up like a year later as I'm trying to learn. And I would say, no, it looks like you're thinner now. And she would say, you are trying, but it was clear that you were lying. Through the years, I came to learn 
that no, here is a case where you simply say, what are you talking about? How thin you are, right? or whatever. And she would say, you're a great husband. Now, of course, now that I'm a care ethic person, I'm still a Kantian, but better at this and a better husband. Sorry, little tangent. Now it's much easier because here's what I do now. So <laughs> sorry. My wife might say, these jeans are all are pretty tight now. Ah, sorry, I've just gained too much weight. Is it pretty obvious that I'm that I'm pretty chubby? And now I would do this. Well, let me see. And as soon as she shows me, I attack. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> sorry. Got it. I'm a better husband now. Very annoying, but right. Notice we would have in this case a very unique maxim. Now again, we're not cheating. But notice this maxim would say something like, in order to make my wife happy, I will lie only in cases where she expects me to lie. And when she finds out the lie, she will think I did the morally good thing by lying in that case. Notice, we have a very unique maxim that only applies in those cases where the person would absolutely approve of the lie as soon as they are made aware of it. You get it? Well, Kant would say no. Now, let me make this more serious. Think of a circumstance like this. Let's say that you are in Nazi Germany or Holland or France or Denmark during the Holocaust. It is 1944 and you're hiding Jews in your basement and a Nazi officer comes to your door and says, are you hiding any Jews in your house? Now, Kant would say you can't lie because you're universalizing lying. But I would say that Kant has gone too far here. I would say that this is a unique case where it admits of not only a unique maxim, but also a unique case of applying CI number two. Are we disrespecting an autonomous agent by lying to them? I would say in that case, no. I would say that that Nazi, that Nazi soldier, is already having their autonomy disrespected and they are not following their own will. They are obeying a maxim that is immoral. They are obeying orders that are immoral because what they are doing is seeking to murder and denigrate the autonomy of these Jews or these socialists or these gay people or these disabled people that I am harboring in my basement. This person's maxim does not need to be respected because they are not acting autonomously. I am respecting autonomy in these people I'm protecting and thwarting the goals of this Nazi, this Nazi soldier. Do you get the idea? They are not behaving autonom autonomously. Their maxims are completely immoral. So I think I'm within my right to protect the autonomy of these people I am, I am harboring by refusing to adopt the goal of this Nazi. Do you get it? Now, please know that Kant in his other writings went back and forth on this kind of case. Now, of course, the Nazis didn't exist yet, so they couldn't put it, challenge Kant with this exact maxim. But of course, these scenarios did come up as, a, as objections. And sadly, in Kant's earlier career, he agreed that those are the kinds of cases that would pass the CI test. But actually, later in, in his career, he became more rigorous about this and said, nope, I can't. But again, you can see that this is a difficulty that there is room for. And most Kantians post Kant, right, after Kant, have said, no, this is a case where this would pass the CI test in those very special circumstances. All right. I hope you like Kant. Thanks.